Washington to Moscow, New York to Paris, Rome to Jerusalem. The prophecies of the Bible are being fulfilled. Stand by for J.R. Church and today's Prophecy in the News. On today's program, we're going to be talking about the Torah design, the divine design of the New Testament. After looking for a couple of weeks at the uh, divine design of Matthew, how that Matthew depicts Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and the life of Christ depicts those five books as they are uh, set the framework for this, uh, these five books are, are of Matthew, we found that the entire five books of the New Testament, that is the first five books, Matthew through the book of Acts, is also designed after the Torah. And we want to share that with you on today's Prophecy in the News. Now, in order to prepare you for this Torah design of the New Testament, let us give some comparisons of uh, the New Testament in general with the Old Testament. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me this divine design of the New Testament. And J.R., there is so much to say. We'll have to very carefully edit our words here, but to begin with, when you balance the Old and the New Testament against each other, they are both covenants. That is, they have a covenantal relationship between God and man, the Old and the New yeah. Covenant, and they are both divided in roughly the same way. There, uh, there are, um, in fact, they represent covenants, mm -hmm. okay? The Old Testament is called an Old Testament, and the New Testament is called a New Testament. So this is the comparison of the two. Mm -hmm. Then they both have two divisions. In the Old Testament, we have the Law and the Prophets. In the New Testament, we have the Gospels and the Epistles. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the themes of each of these also compare. In the Old Testament, we saw three menorahs presented, seven lamp, mm -hmm. uh, lampstands. In the New Testament, we see three menorahs also presented. They are Hanukkah menorahs of mm -hmm. nine lamps each, but they are nevertheless menorahs. Mm -hmm. Three in the Old, three in the New. That's right. And then we notice that the Old Testament corresponds to the Hebrew alphabet. There were once called 22 divisions of these 39 books of the Old Testament. Up until the third century, they mm -hmm. were noted as 22 divisions corresponding to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And we found that the New Testament also corresponds with the framework and the meanings of these Hebrew letters of mm -hmm. their uh, alphabet. So, Gary, this is, this is really uh, fascinating to see all of these comparisons between the New Testament and the Old Testament. It really is, J.R. Uh, and the final comparison, the one we want to really sort of camp on today, is the fact that both the Old Testament and the New Testament have five foundational books. In the Old Testament, it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Those are foundational to each testament. Yes. And uh, what is so fascinating about these five foundational books is that Matthew corresponds to the book of Genesis. Mm. And Luke, uh, or Mark, corresponds to Exodus, Luke corresponds to Leviticus, John corresponds to Numbers, and Acts corresponds to Deuteronomy. And we want to share this with you today and show you how these themes correspond. Now, whoever, whoever designed this had to really be smart. <laughs> whoever, he says. Yes. Well, I wonder who it was. Of uh, course, it's got to be a divine design. We hold the view that the, the Bible is the divine and full inspiration of the Word of God. Uh, it comes from his mind. Yeah. No mere man could have laid out these five books and their themes That's right. and the way they are structured to correspond with the structure, the framework, mm -hmm the outlines of those five Old Testament books. That's right. Genesis through uh, Deuteronomy. So let's begin with Genesis and Matthew. Mm -hmm. Gary, mm -hmm. first of all, Genesis gives us the story of the beginnings. It does indeed. So does Matthew, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. In, in Genesis, we have the creation of the earth and the very first uh, uh, I guess we could say the crowning achievement of the creation of earth is the, uh, the uh, creation of man, that is the first Adam. 
And, and Adam is given dominion over the planet. In fact, in Genesis uh, uh, 129, for example, God, and God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, every tree. He goes through a list of things he's given. And uh, in, in the 30th verse, and to every beast of the earth, every fowl of the air, everything that creepeth upon the earth, uh, Adam is given dominion. So we could call him a king. Mm -hmm. Well, in the opening of Matthew, we have the presentation of the second Adam who comes as king. And he yes. greets his people as King Messiah. Mm. He is the second Adam and he is the king of kings. The law, basically, the five books, teaches us as, as a schoolmaster. But these five books of the law teach grace, don't they, Gary? They certainly do. Because it is God who is virtually doing everything in the Torah. Now, Torah is just the Hebrew word law. Mm -hmm. And in Torah, uh, as expounded by rabbinic commentators, they talk about the behavior and conduct of man, how man should order his life and his footsteps in accordance with God's will. Everything comes across very tightly bound and legalistic. But as we take a look back at Torah, JR, we see the hand of God working in grace. For example, mm -hmm. by grace, he, he creates man, places him in the garden. And when man falls, by grace, God lifts him up again. And then later on, in the story of Abraham in Genesis, by grace, God gives Abraham Abraham, a covenant which is to be an everlasting covenant mm -hmm. in perpetuity. It's all by grace. So we can see grace in the Torah. Yes. So in the five books of the law, we have the law which teaches grace, but in the five books of the New Testament, the foundational books, mm -hmm. we see grace personified. That's right. Now, the the, the uh, most chapters in Genesis deals around, uh, revolves around one story. That is the story of Joseph. Mm -hmm. We have Joseph in the book of Genesis, and we have Jesus, the antitype of Joseph, in the book of Matthew. J.R., how many times have, on, on these broadcasts have we talked about the similarities between the life of Joseph and the life of Christ? Mm -hmm. uh, it's very common. Uh, I think it's not an unfamiliar subject to most Christians. They would yeah. realize that, that Joseph and Jesus uh, conform in typology to each other. But now we're looking yeah. at it in a slightly different way. Now we're really beginning to compare yeah. uh, Genesis with Matthew. Yes. And the story in Genesis is that Joseph goes down into Egypt and then brings the chosen people mm. for their protection. And Exodus shows they're going back out and heading for the promised land. That's right. In Matthew, we have another Joseph and another dream. Wow. <laughs> we certainly do. Listen to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And then, of course, he takes the Christ child, the chosen person. Mm -hmm. Israel is a type of Christ. Mm -hmm. The chosen people are a type of the chosen person. Uh, the promised seed of Israel. It is Israel who produces mm -hmm. this child, Jesus. And he is taken into Egypt for his protection. <laughs> Incredible. Oh, yes. And then, correspondence. Much in the way that the children of Abraham went down into Egypt to escape famine. Mm -hmm. And in the 14th verse of Matthew 2, uh, we have the story of the young child and his mother leaving by night, departing to Egypt. And the 15th verse of Matthew 2, and... and uh, was there, we have uh, the, the uh, family of Jesus being in Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, there's the prophet Hosea, mm -hmm. saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Yeah. Now, J.R., that's really got two ideas attached to it, hasn't yes. it? Yes. Israel is the firstborn son of God. Mm -hmm. Exodus uh, chapter 4, verse 22 says, and uh, Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Mm. And uh, so we've got the, the analogy here, the, the beauty between the two. And then verse 19 also gives us a dream, doesn't it? It does. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, mm. saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother. And okay. go into the land of Israel. Okay, so the comparison of Matthew with Genesis is... 
Uh, basically, it is the story of the beginnings, one of the first Adam, the, the other of the second Adam. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the, uh, the introduction of Joseph and Egypt, and Matthew, the introduction of the antitype of Joseph, also in Egypt and coming out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. That brings us then to the book of Exodus and its corresponding New Testament book, the Gospel of Mark. Gary, tell us about it. Well, it's very interesting, J.R. Exodus and Mark would not at first seem to have much in common. But let's begin by, first by saying that the tone of both books is similar. Yes. The, the emotional level, the ur there's a sense of urgency both in Exodus and in Mark. Yeah, beautiful way to put it. Because in Exodus, we have the story of let my people go, let my people go, let's go. Uh, tonight, we eat the Passover lamb. In the morning, we go. In the morning, it's let's get gone. And then they come to the uh, Red Sea, and the Red Sea parts, and the people cross. And the Egyptians come down into the Red Sea, and they're drowned. And uh, they move on across mm -hmm. into, in other words, it's a hurry up and escape mm -hmm. the world. It really is. And what we have in the Gospel of Mark are words such as, Jesus was driven into the wilderness uh, by the Spirit, mm -hmm. where in other books he is led into the wilderness. Yes. Mark has this urgency about him. We have uh, over and over and over, Mark says, and immediately this, or mm -hmm. and immediately that, or straightway this, and yeah. straightway that happens. That's right. He, yeah. he has a certain urgency about him. There's right? even the word Exodus. forthwith, like, uh, for example, in uh, 129 of Mark, and forthwith, they were coming out of the synagogue. Yeah. And the whole narrative is a rapid-paced journey. Now, interestingly, in Exodus, the theme is redemption out of slavery. Mm -hmm. And Mark traditionally has been called the book of the servant. That is, it presents Jesus as servant. What's the tie-in there? Well, Moses was a servant. Mm -hmm. Jesus was a servant. You remember when, after Moses was dead, mm -hmm. God said to Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Mm -hmm. So Moses was a servant, and we have here, you remember Moses said, uh, There shall arise unto thee a prophet like unto me, and to him ye shall hearken. And this great prophecy of Moses referred to the future Messiah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when Jesus came, they, they wanted to know, Art thou Moses? Art thou that servant, uh, the antitype of Moses? Yes, the Gospel of Mark presents Jesus as the antitype of Moses, the man who brings redemption. Moses brought redemption to a chosen people. Jesus brings redemption to a chosen people mm. uh, as well. We are the, that chosen people. Oh, it it's is a, isn't it? It's a beautiful comparison, and I wish we had more time, but in order to make our schedule on this broadcast, we're going to have to move. Right on to Leviticus, and Leviticus is just absolutely incredible. It the is. book of Leviticus refers to the Levites, that is the priesthood, and their order, and their services, and their sacrifices. It is the temple order. And the Gospel of Luke, corresponding to the book of Leviticus, is the book of the temple. Mm -hmm. Luke is the book of the temple. Wow. Uh, the opening chapter of Luke, Gary, mm -hmm. shows us Zacharias and his ministering to the temple. In the sure temple. does. Yeah. And he comes into the holy place to the golden altar of incense and Gabriel meets him there to tell him that he's going to mm -hmm. have a son named John who grew up to become John the Baptist. The very next thing we see is Jesus being brought to the temple mm -hmm. for his Pidyon Habin ceremony. And uh, uh, at uh, 30 days old and the pair of turtle doves were brought and, mm -hmm. and uh, the head of the priesthood Simeon, the high priest, takes Jesus, the infant, in his, in his uh, arms and he says, this is the light of the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. So the priesthood and the temple formally recognize mm -hmm. the, uh, the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you please. Oh, yes. And then, <clears throat> Jesus, uh, there's the famous incident concerning Jesus coming up to the temple for Passover when he was 12 years old. Yes. There's his bar mitzvah. Yes, it you is. You see, all of these are temple events. Mm -hmm. It revolves around the Leviticus book of the Old Testament. And okay. even to the point that uh, we have uh, in the uh, 20th yeah. chapter of, of Luke. Well, this, wait a minute. Oh, at, okay. at, at 12 years of age, let's yeah. not forget, after three days looking for him, he was found ah, to yes. the priesthood. Three days. Three days. Now, you've got to go amazing. ahead and elaborate on that a little bit. Well, it's got, it's got to have a reference to the third millennium. Hmm. In the third millennium, and of course it's been 2,000 years now, 
since Jesus came the first time. We are about to enter the beginning of the third millennium. I think we're going to find Jesus in the temple. He is the great high priest. He's coming to rule and reign over the earth as King of kings and Lord of lords during the third day, if yeah. you please. <laughs> and in Luke, Jesus presents himself as the stone which the builders rejected. He delivers this discourse mm -hmm. while he is standing in the temple and having discourses with the priests, <clears throat> scribes, Pharisees, the Levites, uh, have several discourses with him and he presents himself as the stone which was rejected by the builders. In chapter 6 of Luke, it says, And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first, and uh, over and over and over again, Gary, we have his reference to his teaching uh, in the Sabbath days. For mm -hmm. example, in chapter 4 and verse 31, he came down to Capernaum, city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. Mm. And we get over here to uh, Acts chapters 19 and 20. We have Jesus, uh, for example, in chapter 19, verse 45, he went into the temple, and verse 46 says, uh, verse 47 says, and he taught daily in the temple. And uh, this just shows the comparison mm. of the story here. The basic story is of Jesus and the temple. Jesus and the Levitical priesthood. It's, the, Le it's the Leviticus of the New Testament. And J.R., this uh, could go, we could go on with this for quite a while. But again, in the interest of time, we must move to the next division. And this is a comparison between the book of Numbers, the fourth book of the Old Testament, and the book of John, the fourth book of the New Testament. Now, at first, you say to yourself, what possible comparison could there be between Numbers, which is the wilderness march of Israel, and John, in which... Uh, Jesus is presented as deity, and yet there is a strong comparison. Yes. In the book of Numbers, the first nine chapters talk about numbering the old generation, numbering the people. Uh, everybody 20 years of age and older. Mm -hmm. The people under 20 years of age do not get numbered in the opening <laughs> chapters of Numbers. That's right. And, uh, and we see this order. And then in chapters 10 through 25, we see the disorder, all of the rejection and the rebellion. Right. And then finally, uh, what chapter is it? About 26. 26 through 36. Okay, in numbers. chapter 26, we have the reorder. As we have order, disorder, and reorder. And we, be, we open this in chapter 26 of the book of Numbers with the, the numbering of the new generation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those who were 20 years of age and under, they are now the new generation, the ones who are going to get to enter the promised land, wow. and they are numbered. You're talking about the new birth, perhaps? Oh, here. yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. That's what the Gospel of John's all about here. We have Jesus uh, revealed, and then Jesus rejected, and then Jesus revealed to the new generation. That's right. And that pattern in John mirrors or reflects the pattern we find in Numbers. Now, Interesting comparison. Uh, numbers, the wilderness march, could be called the book of unbelief yeah. because, because of the unbelief of the people. Right. But yet the theme in the book of John is believe. Believe, <laughs> believe that, 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 the, yeah. that Jesus is who he says Chapter he is. Chapter 20 of John, verse 31. That's right. Absolutely. It's, it's, ab it, it's beautiful. Let's, we've got to read that. We've got to we take have the to. time to read this verse. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So you can see the contrast here between John and the book of Numbers. Mm. The book of Numbers was a preparation for entry into the promised land. Well, the Gospel of John is also a preparation for an entry into the church age. We see... Uh, numbers, preparing the people for what they're going to learn in the book of Deuteronomy. We see the Gospel of John preparing us for what we will learn mm -hmm. in the book of Acts, which brings us then to those two uh, final books of the foundations of each of these covenants, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and the New Covenant, or the New Testament. Wow. Let's compare Deuteronomy to the book of Acts. And this one, J.R., I think is the easiest comparison of all because both Deuteronomy and Acts are histories. Mm -hmm. Acts is a history of the early church. Deuteronomy is a history. Mm -hmm. And Deuteronomy is divided in roughly into three parts. Verse, uh, chapters 1 through 4 of Deuteronomy tell about what God has done for his people. Mm -hmm. Chapters 5 through 27 
roughly talk about what God expects his people to do in response. And the third section, Deuteronomy, the 20, verse uh, chapter 27 through uh, chapter 37. Uh, 34. Talks, uh, 34, the I beg your pardon. Concluding chapters concluding of Deuteronomy. Concluding chapters mm -hmm. of Deuteronomy. 27 through 34 talks about what God is going to do for his people. Yes. So it's a history and a prophetic overview. Yeah. And uh, listen to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Uh, this begins with teaching the lessons of Sinai to the new generation. Mm. And uh, in my Bible here, the uh, heading just above chapter 4, verse 1 says, The new generation taught the lessons of Sinai. Chapter 5 says, The new generation taught the Mosaic Covenant. Mm, chapter, uh, uh, the chapters continue with saying, uh, The new generation is taught this, the new generation is taught that, and so on. So this is the book of Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. comparing with the book of Acts when the church is born and the new generation is, taught, is given the Holy Spirit and taught mm -hmm. the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what's really interesting to me, and uh, quickly I, I'm going to find it, Acts uh, 1, chapter 1, mm -hmm. verse 8, is an outline of the entire book of Acts. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. This uh, is a, an outline of the book, J.R. Mm -hmm. Part one of Acts talks about the Jerusalem experience. Part two of Acts mm -hmm. talks about Judea and Samaria. Mm -hmm. Part three of Acts talks about what's going on out to the uttermost parts of the earth. Yes. So you have that threefold division, just as you had back in Deuteronomy. Yeah. The Jerusalem part of Acts is chapters 1 through 8, the Judea-Samaria part is 8 through 12, and the uttermost parts of the earth section is chapters 13 through 28. Now when we come down to the conclusion of the book of Deuteronomy, we have the Song of Moses and God saying in uh, chapter 32 and verse 21, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. Mm. God says, I'm going to turn to the Gentiles. Wow. Well, Gary, we have the same thing in the concluding <laughs> chapter of the book of we Acts. We do. Acts 28, 28. Be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. It's beautiful. amazing, and it, it's such a beautiful point-by-point -point yeah. comparison. And Jr., this has been a lightning fast trip. Yes, it has, but time is running out. Yes, it is. What we have here, basically, we'll repeat. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts are the five foundational books of the New Covenant, our New Testament. The epistles are commentaries of those first five books, the Gospels. In the first five books of the Old Covenant or Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we have the five foundational books, and the uh, books that follow that are commentaries on those five books. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament framed together. One design is like the other, and it could not possibly have been put together by mere man. It had to be divinely designed. We'll be back in just a moment. This is America's foremost prophetic monthly, Prophecy in the News. You can get a free introductory subscription to Prophecy in the News just by calling this number, 1-800-475-1111. Each month, J.R. Church and the research team give you the news from a prophetic perspective. At least two full-length prophetic studies are included in every issue, plus commentaries on important subjects, education, politics, economics, science. Keep up with the events in Europe and the Middle East by ordering your free introductory subscription to Prophecy in the News right now. Just pick up your phone and dial this toll-free number, 1-800-475-1111. Operators are standing by right now to take your call. If the phone is busy, keep trying. You'll get through, and you'll be glad you did. The newspaper is free, the call is free, so what are you waiting for? Here's that toll-free number again, 1-800-475-1111. Ask for the free introductory subscription to Prophecy in the News. Now we're back. 
Here is our newspaper, Prophecy in the News. This is the brand new June edition. And the very first uh, article here is on the life of Christ outlined by the Pentateuch. And of course, Pentateuch being the first five books of the Bible. Uh, these, uh, this right here is our television uh, program from the last two weeks. I think it would be of interest to you to get this newspaper. Also, next week. We're going to be talking about Israel as the firstborn son of God. What happened to Israel uh, when it was eight days old? Did it receive a uh, circumcision ceremony, the Brit Milah? Yes, it did. What happened to the nation of Israel in 1948 when it was 30 days old? Did it conform to the uh, ceremony of the Pidyon Habin, the redemption of the firstborn? What happened to Israel when it was 30 days old? What about when Israel was 13 years old, did it have a bar mitzvah? These are absolutely incredible prophetic scenarios that have been played out in, modern, in the modern history of Israel, and we are going to see that on our next television program. I hope you'll be sure and tune in. I want you to call and get this newspaper. It's free for the next six months just by calling us here at 1-800-475-1111. One. Gary, let's wrap up today's program. Well, to wrap it up, uh, here's the basic uh, statement we have to make, Jr. There is an overall structure to the Bible. The Bible is not just a, a bunch of loosely connected books. It has a grand design, and, and God is just now opening it up so that we are able to see it. And this is absolutely a marvelous new thing. You know, we yeah. could go on into Romans and yeah. compare the next book after Deuteronomy, Joshua. With, with Joshua. The, Romans and Joshua even compare. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this, this is startling, <laughs> and I think our response to it should be uh, that as we go to the Word from now on, we need to, to go to it as something even higher and grander than we might have thought it was before. And you know, Gary, it seems to me that it all started about last November when we began to see this grand design of the Bible. Where will it all end? Uh, I can't wait. <laughs> it, the, the Bible appears to be so infinite. Uh, there are so many little facets uh, to it, uh, like a beautiful diamond, all those different facets. You turn it this way and you see one thing. You turn it this way and you see something else. Mm -hmm. You turn it this way and it's an entirely different picture. That's what God has done in the layout and the design and the framework of the entire Bible. And one thing that is so important, I think, from this is that we understand that the New Testament is just as divinely designed as the Old Testament. Oh, would to God that the Jewish people could see this. This is J.R. Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up.